said Rosalind's presentation was fantastic. I mean, beautiful technology is very, very exciting, but what I'm going to present actually is not a reality. It's, it's pretty much actually a wish list. What the manufacturing industry sees with the introduction of Internet of Things and Internet of Services, how we envisage the future in, in manufacturing actually and what we can ex expect out of it. Uh, briefly, what I'd like to talk about actually is four stages of industrial revolution. And Professor Rosen already talked about Henry Ford's actually assembly line. In fact, that's actually one of the starting points of actually in, um, um, in the industrial revolution and how the industry 4.0 came about and where the name has come. Um, how does Internet of Things, Internet of Services, and what we call cyber physical systems actually um, introduce into, into manufacturing and what they would do? What we are expecting in very, very simple term is uh, first, the horizontal integration of value networks. I'll explain that in a minute, what, what I mean by that. And then obviously, end-to-end -end engineering across the value chains, uh, meaning that the cradle to grave, how can we design products that actually, product in fact knows where they are in their life cycle and what they are supposed to do uh, during the entire life cycle. And then the vertical integration of value networks. And then finally, what are the future challenges as far as the manufacturing industry sees it? Uh, this is a um, uh, four stages of industrial revolution. And the first one is obviously 1784, the uh, introduction, in, introduction of actually uh, machinery in, into industry. And then the second one is the Cincinnati Slaughterhouse, 1870. And then 1970s actually manufacturing industry sees the introduction of PLCs uh, into, into manufacturing and then we started talking about automation. It's quite interesting, even back then uh, we talked about computer integrated manufacturing and our vision was to have a factory without human. What we realized that, that that's not possible. In fact, the, what we realized that the, we need human being actually highly skilled and now everyone talks about man-human collaboration and uh, Professor Rosen's actually uh, presentation was a good example that you need to bring surgeon and the robot together and they work together. And people actually try to enable that in the, in the manufacturing environment as well. And then finally, uh, people have been asking this question in the last 10 years or so, so where are we heading? And the, with the introduction of Internet of Things and in, uh, Internet of Services, now we, we are talking about another industrial revolution and the, the idea there is that the, we have the physical world in the factories and then the, we have the cyberspace and the Internet of Things actually is going to bring things together. What does that mean for manufacturing? Then can we control the physical world? What goes on in your factory is actually in a cyberspace in real time. That's actually what is the wish list. That's what we are trying to do. Why do we want to do that? Then if everything actually is done in real time, then we don't have the actually time lag between information flow and the delivery of physical goods. When this is happening, something else happened. Uh, before the Industrial Revolution, uh, the, everything actually produced by the craftsmen, it was actually one of a kind according to customer requirements. With the introduction of assembly lines, we actually started moving towards what we call mass, mass production. And that's economies of scale, obviously. But what happened is we, we came actually full scale. Uh, towards the 90s, uh, we started talking about mass customization. To an extent, we enabled that uh, through design, modular design and assembling products with actually different configuration at the assembly line. But they, that wasn't enough. Customer now talking about actually mass personalization, meaning that the, I want a product just for me, no other equivalent, and the question becomes actually how I can manufacture a mass personalized product in a, in a factory which is built for actually mass production. And then there are actually two different sort of uh, movements coming from a technology end and from the market end. And in that obviously we talk about now um, a, a future world and we are, we are talking about actually global production networks talking to each other. Manufacturing is a global business. Uh, at any time, we get the material from somewhere, we, we produce subcomponents, they are assembled, they are distributed everywhere. Uh, can we actually get these entities in the global production networks actually talk to each other in, in real time? Why do we need to do that? Um, 
because of the batch concept, we built actually entities in different parts of the world, but the utilization of these facilities is actually fairly low. But if I know that one of my partner actually has a warehouse somewhere around the world and the utilization is only 50%, can I use actually their warehouse to deliver my products as well? So we are talking about sort of futuristic images. And the, in order to allow that, obviously, we are talking about uh, cyber physical system, uh, smart machines. We are, not, we are not really talking about perhaps smartness in the, in the context of uh, autonomous, context aware. Uh, they do things actually uh, autonomously. And that's, that's what the introduction of smartness into factories that we are, we are sort of envisaging. If you, if you have a look at the big picture, obviously, uh, the cyber physical system platform is going to sit somehow in the middle. That's, that's how we, we see it. Whether that technology is there, um, I attended actually a a meeting in Portugal a few years ago, there was a software professor. When we actually presented this, he started laughing. He said, look, there is no such a technology as yet. But as I said before at the beginning of my talk, this is actually just a wish list. And then obviously, so what, what, we, are, what we are talking about here is, is that the uh, smart factories, smart homes, smart buildings, uh, internet of people, social web, why, do we, why are we interested in the social web? We are getting to a stage now that the customer wants to design their own product. If we are talking about mass personalized product, we are going to uh, see customers designing their product actually in, a, in an internet environment and the, uh, the manufacturers actually uh, need to uh, pr produce that. So we are talking about uh, all of these smartness coming from different perspective integrated somehow in the cyber physical environment. If I zoom in, and have a look at where the manufacturing actually sits. So we are talking about smart grids, uh, decentralized actually factories, green factories, generating their own electricity, for instance, from entire renewable energy. But the people also know that the, one of them is intermittent energy supply and manufacturing is actually very dynamic, fluctuates. How do you match it together? You need actually real-time real control of it there. We are talking about smart products. Products know actually why they are manufactured, who are the customers, and how they are uh, um, going to be manufactured. We are talking about smart buildings. The factory is at the moment built as a, as a shell, no interaction with what's going to happen inside the factory. And as a result, we have actually huge inefficiencies. So if we know that the factory itself, the building itself is smart, then it can regulate, for instance, the HVAC system according to need in the production. Why that's important? I've done a lot of work in the energy efficiency domain, for instance, in factories. Up to 25% of the energy actually is consumed by the HVAC system and auxiliaries in any factory. And majority of the time, they run 24-7, despite the fact that there is no production. And then obviously, smart logistics. If you talk to any company, they will tell you up to 80 to 100 million of actually inventory in transit and they don't know where it is. So what happens is that the, with these sensors and the real-time data transfer, we get actually transparency into our logistics system and that's, that's the smartness that we expect from the logistics environment, obviously. With these, so what we are talking about first is the horizontal integration in the value network. So I have, I have actually partners all around the world. So what, what we do at the moment is that the, if, if I want to move into another country, we build another factory. Instead of doing that, can I share the factory with my partners if, if I have actually real-time connections? So we are talking about actually different uh, vertical integration with my partners all around the world. And then we are talking about end-to-end -end engineering across the uh, life cycle of the product. It's a challenge, but perhaps people don't appreciate this, but if you think about a product with a 40 years in the marketplace, and if I'm designing it, how can I design the product end to end from start to finish and foresee what's going to happen to this product actually 40 years later? The biggest problem is data actually or information coming back to the design stage so that I can do something about it. And that is not there, but if the product is smart, somehow actually collect that information and communicate with the designer on a real time basis, I can actually change that. And then the next part is uh, what we call is that the uh, uh, factory, factory itself. Uh, when we talk about 
economies of scale, we usually build dedicated uh, infrastructure, dedicated assembly line, dedicated production lines. But that means I can't actually build one of items. So what we are envisaging is that the, every entity in the, in the factory, from robots to from machinery to tool to, they are smart in the sense that they, are, they have a cognitive ability. They think, they talk to each other. So if there's a customer order comes, majority of these robots actually will be mobile instead of fixed. So they can actually in real time reconfigure themselves for the need, whatever that needs to be pr uh, produced. When we have such an environment, then we don't need to have actually dedicated space. The generic machinery, they reconfigure themselves on a need basis and that'll lead to actually huge uh, resource saving within, within, a, within a manufacturing environment, obviously. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'd like to move forward. So what, what are the issues that we are, we are facing? These are major time actually challenges, not just for industry, but also in academia as well. One of them is uh, standard reference architecture. As I said before, the manufacturing actually is a global business. So if I'm going to vertically integrate with my partners all around the world, how can I make sure that actually we all have the same communication platform? Especially if you are a big company, that could be easy, but if you are collaborating with a small to medium enterprises, uh, they may not have the capability. So that, that's actually one of the issues. Managing complex systems. So if you remember the, uh, the first industrial revolution graph that I showed you, vertical access was actually complexity. So we are talking about actually significantly increased complexity in a, in a manufacturing environment. When you start building one of items, the number of materials that actually go through the production environment goes up and it becomes very, very complex. So how do we, how do we manage that with the, with the help of uh, Internet of Things? Uh, comprehensive broadband in the, uh, um, structure, obviously, for data transfer. Although we keep talking about the real-time you know, data, data transfer, I sincerely doubt the existing broadband system actually is enough what, what we are talking about in a, in a, in a uh, phys physical environment. Safety and security. I'm sure this has already been discussed in this, in this circle. Now we are talking about fairly sensitive issues. The uh, co manufacturing companies, competitors, and their partners actually in various parts of the world. And if everyone starts you know, get, getting access to their own data, what would happen? How do we, how do we cope with that? Um, we are talking about new, actually, Workspace design. This is very much in line with Professor Rosen's, you know, uh, um, you know, presentation. Now, imagine an environment that all the entities are actually autonomous. They have cognitive ability. Then, what would be the role of a factory worker, and how do we actually train them? They no longer be operating the machinery, and they are not making the decision. The decision will be made by the, um, you know, uh, cyber physical system for that. And they, we don't have regulations regulatory framework actually to enable that, obviously. And what we are aiming for actually at the end is that the achieving actually higher resource efficiency. How can we do more with less in, in that environment? If we are mo to move, of course, this is future. When, when I look at actually today, uh, what we call brownfield factories built during the 1960s, and we are pushing them actually towards the internet of things. Uh, we have the legacy of existing infrastructure communication platforms, different databases, uh, SCADAs and MRDEX and you name it. So how do you bring the Internet of Things environment into such a factory? And whenever I talk to companies, they would say, look, don't ask us to actually knock down the factory and build a new one. We'll go to China. So if you are smart enough, you need to bring a solution with these const constraints, obviously. Different capabilities. Obviously, if, if I have a partner here versus if I have a partner in Asia Pacific, we will have different priorities, different uh, expectations. How can I align my expectations with these companies so that they can get on board? And what's most, most important that the IoT actually always use in conjunction with the big data and big data analytics. I just want to remind perhaps actually people one thing. We spent the last 60 years under the lean manufacturing principles actually to get rid, of, get rid of anything excess. Excess inventory, excess data. Now the big data is also excess. 
No one wants to see a big data in a manufacturing environment. What we want actually is smart data, just the right amount of data to make a decision and, and then move on. With that, I'd like to finish my presentation. Thank you.